So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for another discussion hosted by CCAST, the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox. My name is Ariel Leger, and I'm CCAST Grassland Community of Practice Coordinator. Uh, I'm zooming in today from Tucson, Arizona, uh, which is home to the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki Nations. And although I sit in southern, southeastern Arizona, CCAST's Grassland Community of Practice touches on issues such as grassland monitoring that we'll be talking about today that span across broad geographies. CCAS supports issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through case studies, webinars, and workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice focused on grassland restoration like this one, but also, as Matt mentioned before, non-native aquatic species and drought adaptation. Today, we're going to be hearing from Daniel Bunting and Don Wilhelm from the Fish and Wildlife Service, who will be presenting the, about the Grassland Effectiveness Monitoring Protocol. And we're going to follow that with some discussion. And we encourage you, as we go along, to please write any questions that you have in the chat. We'll be coming back to those at the end of the day. And to introduce our speakers, uh, Daniel Bunting is a geospatial biologist in the Science Applications Program in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Southwest region. He has over 20 years experience in national resources and conservation, working in both the private sector, environmental consulting, and for federal government. He has a bachelor's in biology, a PhD in natural resources, uh, and a GIS certificate from the University of Arizona. Don Wilhelm is the regional coordinator for the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program uh, in the US Fish and Wildlife Service Southwest region that spans from Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. And he's worked for the US Fish and Wildlife Service for approximately 30 years, spending the majority of his time working in support of habitat conservation on private lands. He has a bachelor's and master's degree in biology. So uh, Daniel and Don, I'll pass it to you now uh, to tell us a little bit more about the Grassland Effectiveness Monitoring Protocol. Sure, thanks, Ariel. <clears throat> uh, so Daniel Bunting here, uh, I work for Science Applications. I actually sit in the, the Austin field office. And um, I first wanna thank um, you know, my, my team leads, both Don and I will be co-presenting today, but um, you know these efforts aren't really possible without the help of uh, Mike Dunaway from the USGS Southwest Biological Science Center. He really keeps us grounded in the, the scientific realm, making sure we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's. And then Jim Giacomo, <clears throat> Central Region Director from American Bird Conservancy, um, really keeps us grounded on what the end user needs and, and what, um, what we really want to get out of this um, protocol from the other side, from the resource manager side. Um, so with that, you know, I, I want to start off with this slide. These are some overarching questions I want the audience to think about as we go through the presentation with the understanding that, you know, there's so many different definitions of grasslands. There's so many subbiomes within that ecosystem. And um, a lot of resource managers are working on priority wildlife species. Some of them have disparate objectives and missions. So with that in mind, um, I just want to kind of have these overarching questions such as what success criteria would be most important for your case in evaluating grassland condition. Then also if you do, um, if one of your missions is to um, research and manage priority wildlife species, what, what kind of um, vegetation metrics are you looking for um, to assess habitat quality levels? Um, if vegetation structure is important for you, what types of structural attributes are desired in, in your um, type of work and and you know we're going to get into this during the presentation but as we delved into this realm we realized that there are different end users and um, there there's basically different tiers and levels that we want to um, implement for these protocols and tier one is what we're calling the catalog and tier three is the geo version so more of a, a layman's version a very reduced effort and we'll kind of get into these three tiers during the presentation but in the back of your mind I like you guys to think of what type of um, approach or effort level would be uh, more relevant for your needs. And we'll kind of have an open discussion at the end of the presentation. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand over to Don to give a little background on, on why we even got into this <laughs> realm of grassland monitoring. So take it away, Don. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, hello, um, good to spend a little bit of time with you all, fellow you know, grassland enthusiasts. Uh, and so project needs. So while you know many of us have dabbled with 
biological monitoring and grassland ecosystems over the years, uh, there's just not a consistent or shared approach being applied, uh, especially on private lands in the Southwest. Uh, and within the boundaries of the Oaks and Prairies joint venture in Texas, where I've spent a large portion of my career, you know, for the last 30 years, various conservation partners working together, including NRCS, Parks and Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Service, several NGOs, We've been implementing grassland uh, improvement projects via these incentive-based programs. Uh, and of course, many of you through, or, and around, others around the country have been doing similar work. Um, so in our Southwest region, and just through the partners program alone, we've allocated about $2.8 million annually to private landowners, uh, resulting in over, well over a thousand projects that involve some form of grassland habitat improvement and uh, easily 500,000 acres uh, we've applied these various conservation practices on just through the partners program. Oaks and Prairies joint venture since 2013. Uh, they have a grassland restoration incentive program known as GRIP and through that program they've allocated two million dollars in incentives to over 100 projects covering 109,000 acres. Uh, oh. So there, you know, there are three main needs we've identified for GEM, as we call it, grassland effectiveness monitoring, GEM. Uh, we need to quantify effectiveness or biological outcomes of the, these many grassland and habitat improvement projects, because there's just so many questions we have, you know, that we need to answer on the effectiveness of these initial treatments and the need and timing for planned follow-up treatments, et cetera. Uh, we need to monitor grassland plant community trajectories post-treatment. We need to share our successes and failures to provide lessons learned. Uh, to allow us all to apply adaptive management. And we, you know, we need to value the, uh, validate the value of these incentive programs you know, in order to secure it additional funding, guide future conservation uh, priorities on a, on a landscape scale. And so you know, the bottom line is all of us, the habitat conservation community as a whole, uh, we need to be able to verify that our efforts are effective to our funding recipients, uh, but especially to the entities that provide the necessary funding for all our work, including Congress. Uh, I think Jim Giacomo is on the, the phone, the man formerly known as the Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture Coordinator. Uh, he and I joke about uh, how many conversations we've had over the uh, last decade or more with so many people about establishing a, a monitoring protocol that we could all use to start evaluating our respective programs. and. And many, many folks and groups were interested and it was honestly a little bit overwhelming as we tried to put something together. So we decided to try to form a smaller group uh, comprised of the, the following cross section of our, our JV's conservation community to develop uh, and put forward the plan that we're presenting to you today. Uh, as it says here, it includes the Fish and Wildlife Service folks from the Partners Program, uh, our Science Applications Program, which uh, did provide most of the funding for the work we're gonna describe. Uh, refuge system through their inventory monitoring program that we're involved, coastal program, and then folks within our migratory bird office. Uh, the USGS, uh, Southwest Biological Science Center, has been involved directly. A couple of staff from, from that office, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Oaks and Prairie JV, Rio Grande JV recently started uh, working with us, American Bird Conservancy, and then we reached out for some technical guidance, some assistance from NRCS, BLM, and others. So uh, our shared GEM vision is to develop a standardized protocol that is transferable to any entity with a desire to evaluate grassland health and condition. Uh, we wanna provide a platform to support a rapid assessment that maintains scientific rigor. I think we all are aware of our limitations on funding and staff to conduct biological monitoring. That's just a reality. Um, and then we all data collected using digital tablets. We wanted to develop a protocol in, with a GIS framework centralized data management, automated analysis at the end with necessary QAQC, and that we want the front end, you know, an automated snapshot of vegetation cover, height, canopy gaps, et cetera. On the back end, use our environment to automate uh, computations to evaluate our biological outcomes. So with that, Daniel, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sure, thanks. Um, you know, when we got together, one, one of the first questions we asked was um, <clears throat> how to define grassland and you, you could just go down a rabbit hole trying to define what a grassland is and all these subbiomes. And, you know, I, I'm originally from Arizona, 20 years in um, Tucson area has kind of translocated in the central Texas. So 
grasslands over here in central Texas, <laughs> like you can see in the pictures, are much different than southeastern Arizona, and then some arid, arid parts. Um, so, you know, we, we didn't want to get bogged down with just uh, debating uh, on a lot of things. We wanted to do our homework and see what others have done. Didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And so we knew that agencies um, and bureaus had a lot of different monitoring protocols, and they all have different missions and, and reasons for it. Um, BLM uh, aims at monitoring trends on public lands, and NRCS with their NRI monitors trends on private lands. Um, but in Texas, we have little to no BLM lands. And so we really took a, a, a good view on what other agencies have been doing and, and why and what their mission was. And then we also looked at the, the local level, um, what different um, nonprofits and the joint ventures in particular, since they're a team partner, they've, had, they've implemented the Grassland Restoration Incentive Program. And it's kind of more, uh, more geared toward um, avian populations and, and habitat. So we wanted to keep uh, these resources in mind. Um, and what we ended up doing after, after our homework, <laughs> which included general literature review and science-based you know, archive search on, on what agencies have done, um, we decided to adopt and modify the BLM AIMS protocol. And <clears throat> in my previous capacity as a project manager in consulting, um, we ran a lot of different NRI and rangeland inventory projects. And so even though I have a watershed background, I was pretty familiar with what has been done for, for decades, really. And so I thought BLM AIMS would be a, a, a good approach. And so we kind of looked into it. And what we wanted to do is basically keep the components that, that were relative to um, assessing grasslands and then exclude components that, that weren't really going to get at um, you know, the health of grasslands or, or get at what um, treatment effectiveness monitoring uh, would entail. Um, so, and, and those who know the BLM AIMS protocol, it's a pretty intense, comprehensive protocol. It includes digging soil pits, and it could take all day uh, uh, for, for one to two um, sites. So we, we definitely want to reduce that with that overarching goal to be a, a rapid assessment. Um, it was good timing because our BLM colleagues were just transitioning from their kind of Microsoft Access platform to Survey123. Those who, who know the ArcGIS online world, they have a lot of functionality and capabilities, and it's a good time to piggyback on what they did, and, and they provided some templates that, that um, we can kind of keep and modify for our needs, so we didn't have to start at ground zero. One thing we did have to do is develop a plant list for Texas because BLM has a lot of public lands in the western U.S. They have plant lists for the state of Arizona and New Mexico, Colorado, so forth, but, um, and it takes two to three years to really come up with a plant list that is meaningful and useful um, for their needs. And so we got together with, with our partners at uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, Jason Singhurst um, was instrumental among others to really um, take a, a 20,000 plant list, break it down. I think I broke it down to 9,000, handed over TPWD and he got it down to um, 3,600. And, and then we put some plants back in, realizing that there are a lot of species that are the woody encroachment species that um, typically aren't found in grasslands that we actually need to put back in because those are the ones that we're kind of documenting along the way. But um, these plant lists are, uh, it's based on the USDA symbol. Um, and if you have any particular species, you have all the attributes that come along with it. So you'll know whether it's woody or non-woody perennial annual, um, the kind of functional group, and then uh, its status, whether it's native or non-native. And so you can kind of see how you can, just from knowing the species, you could get at all these different metrics um, and in a relational database setup. I also want to point out that if you, if you um, went down to the bare bones of functional groups and all you had to do is is understand the difference between a tree, shrub, vine, cactus, yucca, sedge, grass, forb. Most people can do that. And, and so when we talk about our geo version later, I want to I want you guys to keep that in mind. Um, but just know that, that the um, limitation on that is we don't necessarily know whether it's a non-native or native species, um, unless you kind of know the common species and those target species at your site. So with that, we had two goals. Um, one was, you know, 
we formed these partnerships. Don, Don came to Science Applications with the Partners Program um, to collaborate on this, and it's because they wanted to monitor their, their private um, incentive program uh, projects, uh, the grassland activity improvement projects. And um, so it's based on evaluating treatment success and, and developing a standardized approach for that. But we want it to be applicable beyond just Texas um, to, our, to our whole Southwest region. Um, goal number two was to evaluate grassland condition in general. We want to be able to implement um, these surveys and have a snapshot of, of what that condition and trend is. And, and if we do some repeat surveys, we get like a trend over time, a trajectory, much like BLM and NRI does uh, with their efforts by doing some repeat visits. So our core elements are kind of what we're defining as these global metrics that um, basically, whether you're, you're doing the Cadillac or Geo version, um, these are the type of metrics that are going to be covered in, in either effort level. So the vegetation metrics are based on um, line point intercept, and we can get a foliar and basal cover from that and, and vegetation composition and then height as well. And then the ground metrics where we're taking a look at the overlying material such as herbaceous litter um, and other uh, types of, of litter and it, even biotic crust. And then um, the gaps are important for erosion control. This is one that um, USGS and, and BLM in order to make it comparable across these different protocols, um, they wanted to keep the exposed ground surface measurements intact. So we have a, basically an app that this one only takes about five minutes to document um, bare ground gaps. And then we also want to implement these inner canopy gaps to get an idea of um, vegetation structure. Okay, so let's get into these tiers. You know, if, if you had all the funding in, in the world and you had the expertise um, and you had the budget for it, then, then you'd probably just run with the Cadillac version. This has like all the, the bells and whistles. Um, you do the LPI transects, get all the vegetation um, cover data and ground surface data. But you know, the, the LPI doesn't cover plant density. You're gonna need some kind of plot level um, vegetation survey. So this is where we're, we're implementing belt transects for the Cadillac version. And that will give you, you can count any plant unit per, per area. So it'll give you plant density. And then also a kind of a secondary ocular cover estimate kind of using the um, relevé method where we have different bins of percentage, uh, percent cover um, to track. And then, you know, that's really important for those who are monitoring whether it's native or non-native woody encroachment. They're going to want to know um, the number of plants um, per acre over, over time. Um, that might be tracking um, treatment effectiveness after a prescribed burn or even bulldozing the area, you expect the trees to go to zero, but maybe uh, there's recruitment um, pretty quickly after. So those are belt transects and plant density are, are definitely important for, for the woody component. Um, and then species inventory. If you know the species, um, then, then there's a way to quantify species richness and abundance. Um, we kind of piggyback to BLM aims using a circular plot, and that's also comparable to, to NRI. Um, I'm going to skip down to the geo version. You know, we wanted to do a version that doesn't require botanists or doesn't require um, someone to know all the plants. So we could group these um, plants into functional groups. And like I said, tree, shrub, grass, forb. <laughs> I think anyone could kind of um, uh, differentiate between those functional groups. Uh, what we can't really differentiate is whether they're native or non native, unless you do your homework before you go out to the site and you know those common species. So GeoVersion is really stripped down. You don't have to know the function or the plants to species. Um, and, you know, the gap measurements are, are pretty easy. You could train someone in five minutes and they'll be able to run that. Then version is something in between. And this is kind of what we're testing in our pilot season, our field campaign this year. Um, most groups that are, are doing some grassland improvement projects, they're doing it for a reason. They're, they're tracking um, whether it's tree, trees or shrubs. And, and so we, the purpose of this is um, with the understanding that these resource managers probably have a list of target species. And these target species are management species of concern, or they could even be native species that 
that were reintroduced um, via seed mix or even replanted. And those are going to be want to, you're going to want to track those over time. So then Paula version has the ability to actually track species level if you know the species, or you could also just track functional groups. So it's kind of a, a mix in between. So just getting into a little bit of the sampling design and schematics, if you want to quantify the effectiveness and, and understand the biological outcomes, you are going to have to have somebody that, that knows how to set up a, a bit of a study design to make sure that the statistics and science is there. And so um, kind of our approach is to use the, the Sergo soils and NRCS ecological site descriptions. And you could um, basically isolate some of the variation that, that soils might bring into um, the factor. And you know this, this page right here is just showing a, a particular site that had roads that were buffered um, and then other areas that, that were buffered. So you can implement surveys that you knew were going to fit within these um, regions of interest. Um, our design is, is based on the spoke design, which is um, piggybacking off BLM Ames. It's a 25 meter transect taking line point intercept measurements or canopy hits every 0.5 meters. Um, this center point is, is a spatially randomized, um, it's stratified, uh, stratified random between these soil sets. So that point's randomized, and then we have a randomized first azimuth. So if, uh, if our randomized azimuth is 10 meter or 10 degrees, um, then the second and third um, azimuths are 120 degrees um, plus 10 degrees. So that, that kind of sets up your randomization. Um, and that's basically um, the stripped down version of LPI. If we do the Cadillac version, <laughs> this is where it gets, it looks complicated, but these things can be ran fairly quickly with a little bit of calibration and, and field techs uh, with um, some more experience. So um, in order to get plant density, like I said, you're gonna need some kind of plot level. So you have some kind of unit area, area to camp, uh, count trees or, or shrubs. And we also uh, include ocular cover. And that kind of came about because you might have some um, grasses like Bermuda grass or, or something that isn't really a bunch grass that isn't easy to count. And um, so it might be easier to count within uh, a range for ocular cover. Um, species richness is kind of this, this uh, shaded area um, is actually um, 1641 meters squared. And that's piggybacking off of BLM Ames and NRI. So in order to be comparable with those protocols, we, we kept that area the same. And so the process of a species inventory, you're gonna know the species that you've already um, come across in the LPI transects and the, and the belt transects, um, but you also do a 15 minute survey in that whole study footprint, um, uh, just taking account of any incidental species that, that weren't um, found during the actual formal surveys. Um, and then, you know, plant den density, um, I'll get into the apps, but you're just counting trees within those areas and it's kind of automated what the um, density per acre per hectare is. So leveraging RTS online, the um, AGOL is kind of, it could be a fantasy world to people who haven't kept track of the evolution of Esri over time. Maybe people are still on ArcView 9.3, but <laughs> we, we've um, gone to, from ArcMap to Arc Pro now, and AGOL has all kinds of functionalities and capabilities. And so um, the DOI has kind of uh, adopted um, this, this approach, and it's a good way to centralize data and manage um, data. So I don't want to get too heavy into this, but I did want to um, mention that that this is uh, how we make these things happen. These survey one, two, three applications are created using um, ArcGIS Connect. And then there's navigation apps um, in the field using field maps. So when you, when you dig deeper, ArcGIS Online has a lot of functions and capabilities that, that can help increase efficiency when it comes to these type of protocols. This is a schematic of the apps that we created. There, you know, this is a busy slide. There's a lot going on here, but I, I did want to point out, you know, overall the LPI, it could take 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the train and depending on the species and the amount of unknowns that's in the Cadillac version. Um, gap can be done in five to 10 minutes. Plant density and cover could be done in five to 10 minutes. 
um, species richness and abundance could be done um, anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how many incidental species you have in unknowns. Um, and then I put this uh, gem geo version just to um, highlight that this geo version will really take advantage of these two apps, whereas um, the Cadillac version takes um, advantage of all the apps. And, um, and you know, we're also talking about potentially using LAMP PKS in place of the geo version. They're very comparable. LAMP PKS is a public facing app. It's already available. They, they have updates coming soon. I think a LAMP PKS 2.0. Um, and then um, the Cadillac version, we always have in the back of our mind how we can leverage remote sensing. I, I actually have a remote sensing background. Um, and so I'm, I'm keeping track of, you know, what we might be able to do in the future. All of our LPI transects and spoke designs have center coordinates. So it, it's, it'll be really good data to use for val validating remote sensing data. And a lot of our work is on private lands. And it's another way that we could do um, some monitoring um, outside of having to get access um, every year, every two to five years into some of these areas. And then the Impala version is somewhere in between. That's really up to the manager um, to, to figure out what their main species of concern are and, and what complexity you want to get into. You could always just do the geo version and then maybe if plant density is important to you, you can grab that one too. Um, species richness, it might not be that important to you. So it's, it's just kind of up for debate for, for your individual program needs. So now I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go under the hood a little bit just to show you what these apps look like on a tablet or phone. So again, this is survey one, two, three. Um, the forms, um, you create these using forms that are very similar to um, Excel forms. Um, but I, I wanted to show you some of the functionality for people that do know the plants and that would uh, um, go the Cadillac version way. You could just start typing in a common name, mesquite, and it'll start coming up with the grass um, mesquite species and the tree mesquite species. Or you could maybe, you know, there's bare grass and blue stem. So you're going to look up Bothria cloa and it'll kind of um, populate the list automatically. So that's actually really handy in the field instead of having to Google or take notes and validate. A lot of people have plants on the tip of the tongue and they know confidently what it is, but um, they, they don't have this list right in front of them. So that speeds stuff up in the field. Um, soil surface, like I said, um, the overlying um, loose um, surface can be herbaceous litter, uh, loose woody litter, uh, lichens, deposited rock. This is kind of um, hummocks or, or um, wind, wind blown that, that might be overlying a plant. Um, then other litter such as trash. Um, and then the actual soil surface um, is where we get our metrics for the actual substrate. If you don't, if your pin flag doesn't land on, on a rock or a um, substrate, it could land on an embedded woody litter. And we keep track of that because um, these components are important for um, erosion analysis. Um, as far as heights, you know, again, these overstory, understory pin hits are, are done every 0.5 meters. Heights are taken every um, fifth interval. So every 2.5 meters. And we just mark the first or the tallest um, um, woody vegetation, whether that's a tree or, tree or shrub, and we estimate the, the height. And then the first um, hit for herbaceous or grass species. Um, and then we take the, the um, height in that category. Now the geo version, um, if you didn't know the species or the plant two species level, you could, you could put tree, um, perennial grass and annual four and call it good. The one thing we don't know yet, and we're going to test this this year in our pilot season, is um, if we don't know that whether it's native or non-native, we're going to have to put unknown. And that might not be favorable or desired when we try to do this back-end analysis. If, if one of our success criteria is percent um, native over non-native, or one of our treatments is, is getting rid of um, non-natives, then we're going to have to track that. So that's where some of that prior knowledge or doing your homework with the field text to, to be able to differentiate whether it's a native or non-native. And a lot of people, you know, they're, they're going to know within their geography or within their 
their um, grassland, um, what the target species are, like, you know, buffalo grass, for instance, fountain grass. In Arizona, people are going to know that those like the back of their hand, whereas out here it might be a little bit different with yellow, um, blue stem and, and whatnot. So that's the topic of discussion. Uh, if you guys have comments on that, I, we'd definitely like to hear about that. Um, as far as this front end analysis, this is kind of what we've embedded on this automated analysis. So as, as we do these LPI surveys, this is automated on the fly. Um, at the end, before you submit the data, you could take a look on just a, a snapshot of what's going on. That's everything from um, the overstory cover percentage versus bare ground, um, the herbaceous height and woody height within bins classification, and then the, the mean heights, um, and then just soils, exposed soil, exposed rock, everything you can think of really. And um, everything's tied to a unique survey code, which is very important because ultimately all this data is being exported into a central location. It could be export as a CSV, and this is the magical code in order to pull out the site, the date, um, which transect it is, and then what survey it is, LPI. And then these are field text, um, just code, so you can uh, relate those if you have any questions down the line. Um, again, live plants versus dead plants and their percentages, and then a whole automated list of the species that, that you um, compiled throughout the surveys including unknowns and the Cadillac version if you have unknowns there's going to be one extra step at the end of the whether it's at the end of the day or end of the field season you're going to want to keep track of the unknown codes and once they're verified with a plant key an herbarium or botanist um, we're we're going to have a look basically a, a lookup table or a copy and paste option in the R environment to replace all those unknown codes with the verified plant code, and then you run the analysis after that. Um, back to the survey one, two, three app. This is for plant density, just to show you. It's defaulted by this 25 meter by six meter um, area, but you could subset that if you had tons of bunch grasses and you weren't gonna count them in that huge area, you could subset it, push this, and it'll automate um, the plant density um, by the count, just depending on that. We have options to count plants within different size groups or uh, combine them all. You might want to um, combine all the live together or just count the dead and decadent ones. Um, plant cover, uh, just again, it's kind of a, a relevé method, this range of cover estimates. And this is kind of a redundant from some of the cover that you might get in the LPI. That's a good way to cross check. And if you have target species, this might be a, a better way to track some of the cover percentages over time if you're trying to reduce non-native grasses, for instance, like um, Bermuda grass or some other grasses that are difficult to count um, in a density form. Um, let's see. As far as um, if you're a project manager and you're trying to track how many surveys your field crew has been doing daily, this is kind of the live data that you get um, as soon as they send the survey after they're done. If they're in a remote location, they won't be able to sync until they're, they're within good cell phone service or Wi-Fi. But once that data is sent, this is populated. And so you could access this on a web browser. So it was just uh, uh, to show you how many um, plots the field crew did per day. The project manager can just hop online live and see um, how they're doing. Um, you know, these are the spoke design are, are done in replicates of three. Um, you can see right here, there's only two. So this was a, <laughs> a case where there's a, a oak mott or maybe a juniper mott, but there's a copperhead in there and they didn't feel comfortable doing that third um, replicate. So they, they decided against that. Um, so if you're a resource manager, you can tell your field crew to go buy some snake gators and get back out there and finish that plot, but it's really uh, up to you. <laughs> Um, this slide is just to re reiterate um, this relational database structure. So in order to run this and automate the analyses, um, it's really based on this, um, whether it's four letter code or alphanumeric, it's the USDA plant symbol. And with that one symbol, you, you could get all the species information and attributes that you, that you can. So you could start to see how we can get, um, whether it's overstory or the entire um, relative 
cover, but you could get cover versus bare ground or no cover, non-woody versus woody, all the way down the line. And you can even break it down to if you have native perennial graminoids versus invasive perennial graminoids. That might be a metric that might be important for someone in, in a particular area. So um, it's just really powerful to, to know that a little code, you can do some pretty good analyses along the way. In Texas, I want to point out, we started adding attributes to our plant list. So whether it's a warm or cold season grass, whether it's increased or decreased or bunch grass side, you know, maybe a, a rancher might um, be conservation oriented or might like this type of app and want to know uh, what might be palatable forage versus um, other stuff. And you, so you could just build onto these, these lists for your own needs and, and build you some backend analysis that's, that's pretty useful. Um, so I, I just wanna close um, before a discussion just on an example of, of one site from our, our field campaign last year. This was in Texas and they implemented um, prescribed burns and brush management. And um, I think uh, these, these color polygons are, are soil um, ecological site descriptions that were kind of combi uh, combined to limit the variation in, in soils uh, or the impact of soils on the grassland condition. So um, with that, you know, I don't want to really <clears throat> concentrate on what the results were, but just to give you an idea of the types of results that we got from these surveys that we've been implementing. And so if these are the type of um, results that you're looking for for your needs, I think we, we might be on the right track. But um, you know, you since you have overstory and understory cover, there's a lot of different definitions. Um, so you have to be careful on how you want to analyze your data and, and figure out what's most meaningful to you. This, for instance, is only the absolute overstory cover. So that counts the bare ground and then the cover um, of that very first plant hit. Whereas relative cover takes away that no cover and just looks at the overall vegetation components and which ones um, dominated. So this shows, you know, grasses um, were in the lead, closely followed by herbaceous and then plants and shrubs to follow that. Um, this is just one uh, one of the treatment sites, which combine two different spokes, and so you can combine the data and look at it into that. Um, detail so you can uh, look at native grass versus non-native grass um, right here. So the, the, these could be represented as tables or figures, but these are just giving you an idea of the, the type of um, metrics that you can get out um, of these. And when, when we say relative frequency here, that's just to denote that we're, we're counting all the plant hits together. So that's overstory and understory, which is different than using just that very first hit of the pin. Um, which would only be overstory. Um, relative cover, just breaking it down between herbaceous and woody between these treatment sites, prescribed fire, prescribed fire, um, brush management, sort of finding more herbaceous in the prescribed fire than brush management in this site. Um, uh, woody is pretty similar. And then non-native uh, versus non-native, kind of similar trend. And then overstory cover by treatment. So again, this is just overstory what that first pin is hitting in the LPI transects. And um, so it kind of varies in, in the brush management. And this one, there's more grass cover in, in the brush management than the prescribed fire. Um, and then so just different snapshots um, to look at at this particular site. Um, you might be interested in perennial grass versus annual grass. In this case, is pretty much um, all perennial grasses at this site. Um, you might look at native grass compared to non-native grass. Um, interestingly, one of the prescribed fires had over 90% native um, compared to these others, which were more variable. Then the gap intercept. Um, you know, I, I wanted to add these pictures because we only had a few sites that even had <laughs> a, a little bit of bare ground in our study sites, most of central Texas and kind of, I guess we're all over the place, south end, northern Texas, um, were pretty dense um, ground cover, which is different than what I'm used to coming from Arizona. Um, so these, these figures are just showing um, really low 
um, bare ground percentages. And that kind of, um, well, I guess Woody Gaps is a little bit different. Um, Woody Gaps is counting these uh, gaps, inner canopy gaps between trees that are um, larger than, than 0.5 meters. So this is kind of showing you this tree back here and this whole open area. A woody gap is basically all this um, inner canopy gap between this tree and the next tree down here. So that might be important for um, different uh, grassland subbiomes or if you're looking for um, different habitat that's, that's important for, for birds or cover, um, et cetera, refuge, um, those type of metrics might be important. And then just distribution of veg vegetation heights, um, woody height uh, varied quite a bit. This is just showing that, that since we had a, a, a huge tree over 1800 centimeters, that there's high variability in the range of woody heights that were collected along that, um, those transects. Um, herbaceous heights were pretty similar across. So those are just other um, vegetation metrics that you can track, whether it's a table of min max and mean or uh, box and whisker plots. And then these are some of the kind of management species of concern. Um, you might want to group all hackberries, you might want to group all acacias, um, et cetera. Um, you know, in, in Arizona, you might be counting um, mesquites and creosote. Um, out here, you might be counting <laughs> um, sweet acacia. Or, or other stuff like southern dewberry and some some brambles, but um, whatever your your management species of concerns are, this is where that that plant density um, app would be useful. Just keep track of um, species over time, um, before, during, and after treatments. Um, this is really getting into the weeds. We counted live, decadent, and dead, and we counted all um, species under one meter from one to three and over three. And that's probably a little overkill. Some people might just want to count um, number of plant stems of woody vegetation um, per acre. So that's really up, up to your individual needs. And I think that might be all, yeah. So again, there's a lot of detail in there. Um, I want to re reiterate that this is a, we're in a pilot season. This is a pilot project, a two year project. We're doing our second field campaign. We ran the Cadillac version and we're pretty successful in getting the types of results that that we were that we wanted to get. And this field season, we're going to um, focus on the Impala and the Geo version to see the types of metrics that we can get and see what shortfalls um, there are. And you know, we we kind of did this non-traditionally, where um, at least me, um, <laughs> people talk about monitoring and quantifying um, success. They've been talking about it for decades. So. I just wanted to get something on the ground. And, and so we implemented these transects. They're, they're well, they're tried and true. They're vetted. BLM uses them. People have been using them for years. And we just want to start collecting real data and then throw darts at it and see where our weaknesses are. And that's where we are. So we we welcome any feedback and and you could scrutinize and let us know what we missed because that's what we're looking for heading into this second season um, before we kind of roll this out. Um, all of our apps have beta, beta 0.3 versions, and we're, we're hoping to refine and kind of um, move toward making a, a real thing that people can adopt and, and use for their needs. So um, with that, uh, Ariel, I, I don't know if you want to um, carry on. Um, I have these, the same slide from my uh, first slide, but uh, I'll, I'll let you have it, Ariel. <laughs> 